1943, Burma. Two years after Pearl Harbor, General Joseph Stilwell opened his long-delayed campaign for a ground supply route to China. With a handful of Americans and American-equipped Chinese divisions, he was advancing to meet the Japanese Imperial Army and drive them out of Burma. Stilwell had molded the once pulpy mass of ill-fed peasant soldiers into skilled, tough fighters, able to meet the Japanese on equal terms. But this Allied penetration named Operation Saucy was unusually difficult. The men had to fight the Japs and the disease-infested jungle in order to stay alive. As a transport pilot, my job was to fly help to Vinegar Joe's army. He was entirely dependent on our 10th Air Force for ammo and medicine, clothing and food. Stillwell's men marked their drop zones as they inched steadily closer to Jap positions. The progress of an army depended on a co-pilot's signal. General Stratemeyer had warned the Pentagon, the only way we can supply any force that advances into Burma is by airdrop. That's why when Stilwell started this offensive southward from Lido, he had air supply for his advancing troops. Our supply pushers developed bombsite precision. For the past year, split-second timing had meant survival to lonely air-warning outposts perched on jungle-covered ridges in the Naga Hills. Air supply and the successful teamwork of the Eastern Air Command now made it possible for the Burma campaign to drive ahead. But in the jungle, the mission that the Joint Chiefs of Staff had given General Stilwell was one of the toughest in the war. He had a most difficult physical problem of great distances, almost impassable terrain. Cutting their own trail, Stilwell's army stumbled along at barely a mile an hour. The Chinese jockeyed for a frontal position, flanked by other Allied forces. It was a two-pronged drive to split the Jap wedge and reopen the Burma Road. The advance by the Chinese army into the Hukong Valley was the most ambitious campaign yet staged on the end of a thin airborne supply line. With amazing vigor, Stilwell carried on. Wounded men, the enemy, and the jungle were his obstacles. Quick evacuation of casualties could hasten the campaign, cut it down to months instead of years. But how can you get a wounded man out of the jungle fast? In the CBI, a plane we called the Sky Jeep was the answer. It was both a light transport and an ambulance. Able to operate from temporary airfields, we achieved a high degree of mobility and secrecy. In one month, 10 sergeant-driven Sky Jeeps carried out more than 700 casualties. With one of Stillwell's wounded soldiers aboard, the last chance got ready for takeoff. campaign made full use of air power, from transports and bombers to an armada of sky jeeps. Upwards of 100,000 men were constantly supplied and evacuated by air. Eventually, the Allies were able to drive the enemy out of Burma. Down at Allied bases south of New Guinea's Owen Stanley Mountains, another army of men and planes prepared for the first Allied paratroop drop in the Pacific. It was designed to cut off a large force of Japs at 
NADZAB in northeast New Guinea. Early in the morning of 5 September, 1,700 sky jumpers in full battle array climbed aboard a fleet of General George Kenney's 5th Air Force transports. At 0825 hours, the first C-47s rolled down the runway. Within 15 minutes, three flights totaling 79 planes took off. In all, 302 aircraft slid into place and like a mighty procession, paraded toward Nadzab. The pilots gradually dropped from altitudes of 3,500 feet down to 500 feet. So far, no trace of the enemy, but no chances were being taken. A squadron of low-flying attack bombers laid columns of smoke on the floor of the Nadzab Valley. Once over the target area, the transports formed into three columns, each with 32 planes. The 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment and a battalion of Australians tumbled out to make their first drop, and with success. NADZAB, the Japs' back door, was left open. With Allied forces firmly installed in northeast New Guinea and the Solomons, General MacArthur and Admiral Halsey could now threaten Rabaul, the enemy's main supply center in this critical area. For three days in a row, we were alerted for a strong, low-level attack to knock out Rabaul on New Britain Island. At forward staging bases in New Guinea, our B-25s waited for weather as we got ready. We were going to depend on our gunners to neutralize enemy planes in Akak in order for the rest of us to smash the airdromes around Rabaul and then destroy the concentration of military shipping in Simpson Harbor. Ever since January 1942, units of the 5th Air Force had continually blasted Rabaul. Today, November 2nd, 1943, the briefing officer announced that the 8th Photo Squad flying recon over Simpson Harbor had seen seven destroyers and 20 merchant vessels. At the airdromes, they had counted 237 planes. This sounded like a rough mission. At the fighter pilot briefings, P-38 boys were given details of the plan that required perfect coordination between bomber and fighter elements. Surprise and timing were the main springs of the battle plan that the successful air campaigner General Kenny now put in motion. Briefings over, five squadrons of Mitchells, a force of 80 medium bombers, were boarded and revved up. Shortly after 1000 hours, the tower gave them the go ahead and the bombers got underway. the fighters got ready. From six squadrons of lightnings, two squadrons had orders to sweep Simpson Harbor, four to flank the land batteries. In all, 80 lightnings scrambled off. bombers held their formations as we headed toward Rabaul. Leader of our shipping strike forces was a veteran of 80 strafing missions, 25-year-old attack group commander Major John Hennebury. Once over the Solomon Sea, the Kenny plan went into high gear. As we scanned the skies, we spotted what we were looking for, enemy aircraft. Our lightning swept in ahead of the bombers to clear the area. When two zeros challenged Captain Ralph Bilge and his wingman, he opened up. The 
first, Bills didn't connect. So he got his 38 on the Jap's tail, and the battle turned into a chase. Lightnings ran into more than 60 interceptors. The P-38 escort, led by Major Gerald Johnson and Captain Richard Vaughn, flew interference for the anti-aircraft neutralizing forces. They attacked swiftly and with a double intent of covering the B-25s and destroying the enemy. Our surprise visit gave the Jap pilots at Lacuna Airdrome short warning before the speedy P-38s peeled off and dropped their bombs. We dove in on aircraft, parked on hard stands and revetments. Three minutes later, four bombardment squadrons approached the target area. Assigned to neutralize shore anti-aircraft positions, the B-25s peeled off. fragmentation bombs, because of their delayed explosions, permitted us to get down low and blast the enemy out of their hiding places. It was this complete neutralization which finally enabled our striking forces to make dangerous mast high runs over Simpson Harbor. this day, we bombed 24 enemy ships. We strafed 17. Our bombers destroyed 52 enemy aircraft. Our fighters claimed 42 shot out of the sky. The cost, 45 American flyers, 17 American planes. In the space of 12 minutes, a formidable Japanese sea and air armada was attacked and decisively defeated. After two years of war, the Japanese strategic plan had been fatally upset. But the Allies knew the enemy was not yet destroyed. Her armies and navy still controlled conquered territory. General Arnold told the world, there are many roads that lead right to Tokyo, and we're not going to neglect any of them. Relentlessly, the Allied attack had to continue, spearheaded by the striking power of the United States Air Force. Oh. 